my name is Stephanie Rutledge. I'm one of the second year fellows, but I think you probably know that. Um, so this is a case of an 81 year old woman with a history of diastolic heart failure, AFib, morbid obesity, sleep apnea, spinal stenosis, and she's wheelchair bound. So you can probably get a sense of her phenotype in your mind. Hopefully you can see her in your mind's eye. She has been having recurrent food impactions since 2018 with five EGDs on our system since then. And for one Friday evening at six o'clock, she came in with complaints of being unable to eat or, or take any of her meds since Tuesday. So she was a patient of Dr. She still is a patient of Dr. Rubens and Dr. Wang, Christina was on call. So the two of them took her to the OR for an endoscopy on Friday night. But before I go to the endoscopy finding, this is what her ex chest x-ray shows. You can see, um, I don't wanna give it away, but there's something obscuring the retrocardiac shadow or but behind the heart, you don't seem to be able to see the nice diaphragmatic border very well. And there seems to be something large there. And then I won't say much about her CT, but there is, seems to be something abnormal. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but here. And then this is what they found on endoscopy. This is actually an amalgamation of her endoscopies over the last few years. I just picked the best images because they all essentially show the same thing. But if you, so you see the food here, it's been cleared on the top right. But I think this is a really good photo. If you look here, you see something interesting. So you see the scope coming through the GE junction and we're in retroflexion. And then you see something else here. So I actually, would, before giving it away, I would love to know what people think, especially about this middle finding like why do we think she's having food impactions and what what is this like it might be a parasophageal hernia, parasophageal hernia. since no one yes. else is you're correct that's exactly what it is and uh, for the fellows who may not be able to sort of recognize that, so remember what a parasophageal hernia is stomach kind of sliding up next to the GE junction. So if you look on the retroflex view, you can see the scope coming through right in the middle and there's something pouching up on the left side of that scope. So you can imagine the GE junctions in the right place and there's other tissue that is north or superior to the GE junction. These are really hard to recognize. Yeah, I think this is an amazing shot. This was the only one over the five years that really shows it this well, which is great. And here's what, like, sort of based on what Satish is saying, these are the two types of hernia. So there's the more common sliding hiatal hernia that we see very commonly. So the G junction oh has been displaced. Hi, I can't get in here and I'm trying to above press the button. Diaphragm. Oh, why did I have that? Edumilla. <laughs> and on the right side, you see the parasophageal hiatal hernia. So the GE junction is, is in its usual place, but there's a defect lateral to it in the phrenoesophageal membrane and the fundus has herniated up. And so that's a true hernia where there's an entire hernia sac that's displaced in a location where it's not usually, uh, which is the definition of a hernia, whereas the hiatal hernia is more of a sliding upwards. You don't have that hernia sac. And then there are four different types of hernias just to sort of, this is more out of interest, but the parasophageal hernias are typically not pure parasophageal. So usually you don't have your GE junction in the perfect place and the parasophageal hernia herniating up right beside it. You usually have a little bit of a mixture. So a type three is like a little bit of a sliding her hiatal hernia with a parasophageal component. So here you see the GE junction is displaced and there's that herniation as well. So most hernias are most parasophageal hernias are a type three and not a pure, pure parasophageal hernia. Although her imaging, her endoscopy does look almost like a pure type two, but it's really hard to tell. Some of the complications of parasophageal hernias are you can get gastric volvulus. So that, that herniated stomach can become strangulated and cause ischemia. You can get dysphagia when that huge hernia compresses on the lower esophagus or after you eat and drink, you can often get postprandial pain. I think it's because when the when you eat or drink there, you usually have fundic accommodation to allow for di for digestion in the stomach, but the fundus is all up in the hernia. So you're you essentially are having like almost like a functional dyspepsia. And then 
as we spoke about last week, Cameron lesions are where you get ulcerations around the, the hernia where it's indentated by the diaphragm from local mucosal tension and ischemia. And you can get respiratory complications from simple mechanical complication and compression of the hernia on the lungs. And so the thinking about how we manage hernias of paracetamol hernias has changed a lot over the last 20 years. Most experts advocate against repairing them surgically prophylactically. And that's because the annual risk of developing acute symptoms that need emergency surgery are less than 2%. And the mortality rate from an elective repair is about 1.5, 1.4%. And that risk of acute symptoms really decreases after you hit 65. So where did this new recommendation come from? Because prior to the 2000s and the days of Hill, who described some of these hernias, they described really cohorts where nearly 50% of patients with these hernias were developing complications. So the authors of this paper did a very large Markov Monte Carlo decision and analytic model, which I had never heard of. Essentially, you create a hypothetical cohort of patients based on these big studies that we already have done. So it's retrospective and sort of like a machine learning type algorithm where you, you divide patients into two strategies, the repair or the watchful waiting. And then you look at what happens to patients who undergo elective repair. And for that, they use an analysis of 20 studies. And then you look at the watchful waiting and emergency surgery patients, and they used a payer database and surgical literature over the preceding 36 years. And they looked at patients' outcomes in quality adjusted life years. And the way they did that was they put patients into a sort of an algorithm and you can, they can either have an elective repair, they can die or survive, and if they survive, they can have an uneventful recovery. And basically every month, a patient has an option to either have a complication, to, have, to just be watchfully waiting and doing fine, or to go for their hernia repair. And based on the studies that have been done, they look at the probability of each of those things happening. And they run that cycle over and over again till they sort of figure out what, what happens to that cohort of patients over years doing this, this um, algorithm of options. And basically what they found was watchful waiting was the optimal strategy in over 80% of patients and elective repair in 17%. Meaning that if elective repair is recommended to patients who are asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic, less than one in five of patients age 65 will benefit. So that was a paradigm shift in the thinking about repairing these hernias because it showed that you really your risk of surgery is outweighing the benefits or the risk of elective repair especially as you get older, because here you see the probability of acute symptoms decreasing um, as age increases. I don't know why that is. I didn't understand. Maybe over time, your, your body has adapted to it. It sounds like a very layperson explanation, but I, if anyone knows, I'd be interested because it seems like they just had a lower, decrease, lower chance of complications as they got older. Usually I feel like it's the opposite. So to conclude, parasophageal hernias are rare. They're only 5% of hernias. Most are the sliding hiatal hernias that we see. The complications are valvulus, cameron lesions, respiratory compromise, and food impaction is rarely reported as we saw. But what I think was happening was the food was going up and I can show you where it was probably getting stuck. And the risk of developing acute symptoms is less than 2%. So given this, most experts will, rec will recommend just watching in the absence of symptoms, any patient with a parasophageal hernia. All right, Stephanie. So, yes, Dr. Rubin. Uh, this patient had obviously not read the literature uh, because <laughs> this has happened somewhere between four and six times. Uh, it, it seems to occur only on national and religious holidays. Uh, and and um, she is, um, uh, this was the hardest disimpaction that we've had to do. Uh, a couple of hints endoscopically is that it wasn't a clear shot uh, to get into the, see the whole stomach from the, um, uh, from the esophagus. We couldn't just push things through. Uh, it was very tricky to get through. There seemed to be an angulation there. And I think what happens is as the esophagus gets more and more distended with the impaction, it becomes more, the hernia, it becomes more challenging. And the other hint is the view, as you pointed out, on, on the retroflexed view, where you see a lot of stomach up there, more than you normally would want to see on a retroflexed view. Uh, I have advised her to have surgery uh, because I'm sick of coming in uh, in the middle of the night and doing this in the OR. And 
and she's got, and she actually developed aspiration pneumonia uh, after this. Uh, and I don't believe uh, the literature because she's she's uh, sitting around all the time. She never stands up, uh, and and she's had this happen now uh, four to six times and has had pneumonia. And I uh, don't believe that there's that much risk in a uh, elective repair. Uh, of this. I've tried to get her to come in for an esophagram in between attacks uh, and, and maybe even manometry studies if necessary uh, as a prelude to surgery and uh, she's very uncooperative. She only likes to call when she's been impacted for four days and, and on a weekend. So I'm, I, I sort of disagree in this particular case because of how recurrent it's been contrary to what your, your charts show uh, I think she should have an elective repair. And, and oh, I oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Itzquitz. Uh, Stephanie, you know, you, your conclusion was that if people have no symptoms, watchful waiting makes sense, which you can say that about any hernia and in anywhere, any part of your body. If, if there's a hernia, but it's not causing symptoms, we don't operate. But if it is causing symptoms, you really have to think about operating. And I, I think Peter is right. Um, and, you know, that, that paper that you cited, as interesting as it is, it's, you know, it went back to the 1960s, 1970s, yeah. when we didn't have laparoscopic approaches. Um, nobody really wanted to operate um, because it would mean open surgery. So I think you have to take that, those findings with a grain of salt. Um, so I agree with Peter. One other thing I've, I've actually, I had a patient who developed atrial fibrillation related to parasophageal hernia. So that's another interesting complication of this. Oh yeah. Huh. I actually was arguing that she, I mean, on behalf of all the fellows, I tried to convince her very hard to do the surgery, but she wanted to, she was not convinced. But I thought that actually I would have argued that she does need the surgery because this isn't asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. These are like life-threatening symptoms. So I actually, I agree with both of you. I would love if she would do surgery, but she disappeared off and she hasn't come back. She'll be back. Thanksgiving. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah, Friday night, Thanksgiving, yeah, probably. Looking forward, yeah. Or biggest um, holiday, yeah. Uh, any other comments on this? It's a great, it's a good case. It's good yeah. to sort of see the parasophageal hernia. It's hard to get good pictures of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know if any surgeons who are on to sort of comment at all. Uh, pretty picture. Um, oh, thanks. Uh, Lauren, uh, present your case. Hey guys, good morning. Let me share my screen. Morning. Right. Okay, so this is my case. A 46 year old female with uncomplicated small bowel Crohn's disease diagnosed 25 years ago, intermittently on misalamine, currently not on. Came into the hospital with one month of progressive dysphagia and dysphagia. Oh, can you hear me? Sharing. You're not sharing your screen. Oh, hang on. Whoops. Uh, you guys see it now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Take two. So, 46 year old lady, she's got uncomplicated small bowel Crohn's. Um, if I can see. Diagnosed 25 years ago, intermittently on misalamine, no treatment currently. Came in with a month of progressive dysphagia and odynophagia to solids only, as well as some progressive shortness of breath. Um, her review of systems was only otherwise positive for intermittent diarrhea and hematochesia, and otherwise she was feeling pretty well. Uh, her data, she, she was afebrile, hemodynamically stable, had unremarkable head and neck and abdominal exams. And then she had a normal white count. Her hemoglobin was about her baseline with a normocytic anemia and she had elevated inflammatory markers. And then she did have an outside contrasted CT chest which showed mild diffuse fat straining in the mediastinum concerning her tracheal and esophageal inflammation. I'll also say here that she has not had an EGD in the past. So we took her for EGD while she was inpatient. And these were our findings. So these pictures are of the distal one third of the esophagus and you can see that she's got quite a bit of inflammation. Um, she has these kind of cratered um, circumferential ulcerations um, that also looked a bit linear, but definitely a lot of uh, inflammation and friability when we were passing the scope. Um, and I will say also that she underwent a bronchoscopy this admission um, with biopsy. We don't have any photos from that, 
um, but I'll talk about the path on, uh, for both of those on the next slide. So we took biopsies of this. Her pathology from the esophagus came back with squamous esophage esophageal mucosa with chronic active esophagitis and GMS was negative for fungi. And then her tracheal biopsies came back with chronic and eosinophilic inflammation with small granulomas. So overall, her kind of clinical picture was most consistent with Crohn's disease involving the esophagus and the trachea. She was managed with a prednisone, started on a prednisone taper inpatient, and then the tentative plan was for init initiation of biologic therapy on an outpatient basis. So I'm just gonna take a minute to talk about upper GI Crohn's disease. This may be a little basic given <laughs> the audience, um, but I didn't know too much about it. So I looked at this um, paper from JGH on uh, just a review article on oral and upper uh, gastrointestinal Crohn's. So a little bit on the background. So um, the definition of upper GI Crohn's based on this paper is disease proximal to the duodenum, but it looks like in the past, um, it's actually been characterized as disease proximal to the terminal ileum. Um, esophageal involvement of Crohn's disease is actually very rare. Only 0.3 to 10% of Crohn's patients have uh, esophageal involvement. And then usually this is diagnosed after the onset of intestinal disease in, in, in kind of the patient's 30s. So this is fairly close to the, to the case that I presented. And then we often see findings in the distal one third of the esophagus. And then upper esophageal, uh, upper GI Crohn's predicts kind of a more severe Crohn's phenotype overall with um, increased surgical complications, um, increased need for biologic therapy um, and kind of extra intestinal manifestations as well. So the diagnostic criteria that this paper talked about uh, were by Nugent and Roy. So the kind of first criteria, you can have non-caseating granulomas plus or minus Crohn's elsewhere. So if you have that kind of histologic um, confirmation, then you can make the diagnosis. Um, on the flip side, you can have radiologic or endoscopic evidence of diffuse inflammation, kind of like what we saw on this patient's um, endoscopy and on the CT scan with the mediastinal uh, fat stranding um, consistent with Crohn's and then uh, Crohn's elsewhere. So if you don't have a, a histologic diagnosis, you need to have kind of a, a diagnosis of Crohn's elsewhere in the body in order to make the diagnosis um, of upper GI Crohn's um, without histology. Um, a note on pathologic findings. So I was surprised that we didn't see any kind of granulomas on our patient's esophageal biopsies. And actually this paper talked about granulomas are actually only found in a minority of patients. So almost 60% of patients, you won't, you won't find kind of character, characteristic histologic findings. Um, and then I did come across several case studies that showed um, patients even requiring to get a histologic diagnosis, um, EMR or large deep biopsies to get, really get a good diagnostic yield on the, on the upper GI Crohn's. And then just a brief note on treatment, um, really just kind of follows um, the patient's regular Crohn's treatment. There's really very little data regarding treatment of just isolated esophageal Crohn's or upper GI Crohn's. Um, but this paper did talk about half of patients improving on first line agents like 5-ASAs and corticosteroids. They also included H2 blockers and PPIs there, which um, just to note, don't really impact the underlying uh, pathophysiology of the disease, but do provide patients with some symptom symptomatic relief. Um, and then I thought it was interesting that esophageal Crohn's responds faster and more completely to steroids than intestinal Crohn's does. And patients will oftentimes have complete resolution in just a few weeks. And this patient had um, significant improvement in dysphagia uh, after starting steroids. Um, they talked about second line as immune, immunomodulators and then third line as infliximab. And of course, there's always a role for dilation or surgery if there's any sort of complicated disease like fistulization, um, et cetera. So a couple of takeaways. So upper GI Crohn's is rare, typically presents in the 30s and in the setting of established Crohn's disease. The diagnosis you can either make by histology or by inflammation in the setting of established Crohn's. And then treatments include kind of all of our normal Crohn's treatments. And this pretends a more aggressive disease course than intestinal disease alone. And I will also just uh, comment that the, the other interesting part of this case is the tracheal involvement and the respiratory involvement of the Crohn's disease. And I will uh, probably talk about that next week. <laughs> So, um, any questions? What did the bronchoscopy show? Um, she had granulomas on her bronchoscopy. We don't have any images from that, unfortunately. And, and did those ulcers, I couldn't see it very well, but did those ulcers really look like Crohn's, typical Crohn's ulcers to you? From, from the case reports that I looked at, and I could have included pictures of other patients, but um, it did these kind of... Um, cratered ulcerations did look pretty consistent with the other case reports I came across, but I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts who've seen this. I mean, do yeah, those they, they like don't, they, 
they don't. They, I thought this was gonna be herpes. Actually, I thought it was going to be viral. I thought I, when yeah. I saw this, when I see this, this is herpes. Right. Um, but you know, Crohn's, Crohn's of the esophagus is so rare. I mean, I literally, in my quarter century of doing IBD, I think I've seen less than five cases of really serious, uh, you know, not just a little bit of microscopic inflammation of the esophagus. And it, I've seen it look like all, all different things. So this is not out of the range. It isn't not like Crohn's. It, it does look more like a viral uh, herpetic, but, um, but it really can look like anything. The tracheal involvement uh, in combination with esophageal, that I have not seen, although I've seen tracheal involvement separately. And I even have had one case of laryngeal Crohn's and almost all these patients, as you pointed out, also have intestinal Crohn's, um, you know, more distal, typical ileal disease. It would be very rare. Maybe I've seen one case of this where it was purely thought to be esophageal Crohn's. And the last thing I'll say is 5-ASA makes absolutely zero sense as a treatment for this because these drugs aren't even delivered until they make it to the distal bowel. So there's absolutely no point in treating this with uh, with 5-ASA, steroids are great. They can also be done topically, um, and that can be very effective. Uh, but probably the best treatment of all is, is going to be anti-TNFs. I would like to uh, suggest that uh, there's the possibility that this is esophageal diverticulosis. Um, notice the uh, small little craters uh, scattered all over the esophagus. And uh, I doubt that this is going to be a viral illness, but this easily could be esophageal diverticulosis, which causes dysphagia, uh, multiple small divots like this all over the esophagus, and several of them are ulcerated. So a, um, an upper GI um, barium study may, uh, may readily show little pockets uh, all along the esophagus, and uh, that's a possibility I think that needs to be considered. Is it esophageal diverticulosis or Pseudo. pseudodiverticulosis usually a result of chronic inflammation? So couldn't it be secondary to esophageal Crohn's? Probably not. Um, the, uh, now there's a, a patient I think I share with Rob who I think we, uh, I think has esophageal Crohn's and has pretty significant dysphagia. It almost looks like EOE. Um, and I think we've chosen it, I think it was a patient formerly of Tom Ullman's. Um, and I think we've chosen to treat that patient with like topical steroids, almost like EOE, and he does actually reasonably well. Is that sort of a, does an anti-TNF um, prevent you from having to use topical therapy or do you need to use something on top of a systemic drug? If the anti-TNF works for the primary bowel disease, it will likely also work for the esophageal disease. and. Um, the, the only thing about the uh, topical steroids is it might be a little bit faster than anything else. It, it would not, typically I wouldn't do it long-term um, and I've never needed to for these patients. I, I, I would uh, just, I agree with Bruce that in at work, it's great, but my own experience with any foregut crone, you know, again, I agree with Bruce, esophageal is extremely rare I see EOE far more commonly in the Crohn's patients, but any, any Crohn's disease in the foregut, I find particularly hard to manage even with the anti-TNFs. These can be pretty stubborn to treat. So uh, either PPIs if it's in the stomach or duodenum, topical steroids if it happens to be in the esophagus, I almost always have to rely upon. Hey Jerry, I had a question. Um, you were mentioning esophageal pseudo diverticulosis. I mean, how commonly were you seen? Like, it's a very rare disease entity. I think that, you know, there's association with HIV in the past, but um, I, I don't, I can't really appreciate the sort of stippling that you would typically see in this, in this particular case. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Hello. Um, all right. Other um, other comments or questions about this one? All right. Um, I have a case to present. Uh, thank you, Lauren. It's a great case. You don't see this very often. Um, 
Uh, let's see, let me get my case up here. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Nick is uh, taking his boards. So we decided it was reasonable for him to take the day off, although yeah. there were some debate on the validity of that. Uh, <laughs> all right, so. That that on case before while you're getting this teed up, Satish. There's a um, there's a case reports journal now, and so if you take a mixture of upper GI, Crohn's and and tracheal involvement, I mean that's not going to have been reported a lot, if at all. So that would be a nice thing to add into the literature. Absolutely. I think we have a case that um, I think every fellow has been exposed to who has quite the conglomeration of esophageal, a bit of gastric some perianal and colonic Crohn's um, who Put them together. has been through all of the biologics, can't tolerate bedestinite slurry. So we're always in a tizzy with how to manage her. I think she might also be like a reasonable case report. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking about her as well, actually. Yeah. I'll take a perfect fellow's case. Uh, Liz took her, fortunately. <laughs> Maybe we can do a case series instead. Uh, <laughs> So here's a, talking. Um, I hope you guys can see my screen okay. Um, this is a patient uh, that went to Mount Sinai Queens at 65 years old, has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and basically came in with melanin, weakness, shortness of breath. Had an emergent endoscopy performed there. No active bleeding seen, but down in the duodenum was this, and um, which is clearly abnormal. And uh, they... Uh, biopsy showed mild nonspecific inflammation of duodenal mucosa, which we decided was not very satisfying or helpful. Um, and so they were referred to us for an urgent inpatient EUS, to which we said, thanks, but no thanks, continue. We work up for bleeding. We're not going to do an inpatient EUS of weird polypoid duodenal lesion that had a normal biopsy, but said that maybe we'll need to see him as an outpatient to think about taking it out or figuring out what it is. Colonoscopy was a small adenoma of the colon, normal terminal ileum, saw me in the, office a month, in the office a month later. No recurrent bleeding, feels well. And so, uh, you know, hasn't really had a small bowel evaluation at this point, other than just a regular CT, um, hasn't had an enterography or a capsule. But given the lesion, um, you know, we said, all right, well, let's at least um, investigate this a little bit further. Um, I'm going to switch a screen here. Hopefully, let's see. All right, so you be seeing my endoscopy video. Um, so as you go in uh, through the pylorus in this graciously unedited video, You see a tough fold, then you start to see um, so you see long uh, polypoid lesion on a big stalk here in the middle. And you can see this polyp extends down to uh, duodenum and actually to the second portion of the duodenum and there's a big broad stock that I, I think you guys just saw here. Um, a huge stock here in the duodenal bulb. Um, that, that large polypoid leaf extends down to the second portion of the duodenum and you can actually see it sort of adjacent to and abutting the ampulla. Um, and so we decided uh, I didn't know what to expect when I saw the original endoscopic image, so it's hard for me to tell if this is a large sessile lesion in the D2 or D3, or if this is going to be some pedunculated lesion over here. So um, the question is, what do we do? Um, Did you think this was origin in the stomach? No. I was, uh, I was trying to identify that, and it looked like it was actually clearly coming from the duodenal bulb. I know sometimes you get these huge floppy polyps in the, in, uh, along the pyloric channel that elongate out into the duodenum. This was coming from the duodenal bulb. Uh, 
Okay. So a couple of still shots. Here's another. Oh, hang on. Uh, so, Tish, did you an EUS? Sorry, I missed that part. Um, I that did can... not. Well, I, I was prepared to if needed. Um, but now that I had a good sense that this is a polypoid lesion coming from the duodenal bulb, I didn't really see merits of an EUS here. And I think that's a question that comes up for us a lot is, you know, what's the value of EUS or something like this? And not really. The idea of EUS is to see something is behind the walls or within the wall of the duodenum. Um, but when something clearly is originating from the mucosa, EUS doesn't really add to the, um, the value of the case. Um, at least in my mind here, the like, you know, if you, because it, it does have like a long stock and, um, you know, an EUS could potentially help differentiate, like if this was a, you know, lipomatous lesion or, you know, the other things you would think about in this area would be like a, like a Bruner's gland hematoma, um, you know, because if it's, if it's, you know, very bright hypercolic or has like a pillow sign, you know, on, on serendoscopy and it's lipoma, then you wouldn't need to uh, necessarily resect it unless the patient was symptomatic. But if it wasn't that, then you would have a, you know, uh, a need to go in and, and, and try to remove it. Yeah, it's interestingly enough, I mean, even if it was a lipoma, you know, these things can sometimes uh, ulcerate, twist, and torsion, tors or torsion on themselves, causing bleeding. So that still theoretically one could consider resecting. Um, I, but, uh, I, I agree with you. Just take the thing out. <laughs> I was going to say, Jerry, what would you do? Um, and, uh, so I think the options, you know, to me are EUS, as Nikhil said, just to define the lesion. Um, you could ESD, um, because why not? Um, there's snare polypectomy or endoloop or endoclip the base followed by snare polypectomy. Um, any thoughts from the audience about um, the last two options, snare polypectomy or some kind of treatment of the base before you do a snare polypectomy? Satish, does, doesn't the tip of the polyp look different from the stalk, even on your pictures? It absolutely does. So the stalk itself, this picture isn't great, but I think on the video you saw, it was pretty featureless, like normal mucosa. Yeah. But the head of this, you know, almost looks like it could be adenomatous. Yeah, it looks like a, looks like a pedunculated adenomatous polyp, no? Right. So Satish, uh, tell you what I would do, Satish? Send it to I would, call, I would call you. <laughs> <laughs> but don't keep us... I would take, so, take, so, so there's some value in putting something at the base because the base is really broad. If you think of this as a big pedunculated pulp with a big, large blood vessel in the middle of it, there's some data that would suggest that putting a loop or a clip or something around it first is going to decrease the risk of bleeding or injecting it with some um, something like Epi. So um, I agree uh, you know, with Dave on this is, is that, uh, and I'll show some... Um, uh, hold on before I show that. Um, there is some data, a couple of studies recently. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get back to that. Um, there's a randomized trial from South Korea a couple of years ago, pedunculated polyps over a centimeter, randomized to clipping of the stalk prior to polypectomy versus just polypectomy alone. And they did pedunculated polyps again over a centimeter in size. And basically, you know, in the end, there were some 130 patients they randomized. And the big take home of this, in terms of, um, you know, for the clip versus the no clip group, in the no clip group, there was a much higher rate of severe bleeding. So this is ongoing oozing or spurting longer than 60 seconds requiring treatment. Um, and when they aggregate those numbers, you see about 20 patients in that no, 20% of patients in that no clip group had bleeding that required treatment um, compared to the CLIP group where there was only about four and a half percent of patients. Delayed polypectomy bleeding was about the same in both groups. Um, you know, the no CLIP group, you know, had a couple patients that needed to be uh, endoscoped and retreated, but um, it wasn't statistically significant. But this is a fair number. Yeah, you might say, well, 80% of patients didn't bleed, but the 20% that do bleed, those are stressful. You're wherever you are. This study, I think, was in the colon, but it's really the best data you're going to find. Um, when those things bleed, it's uh, a little uh, scary because, it, you know, when you think about it, the stalk has a huge blood vessel right in the middle of it, and it could be sort of spurting blood, and you lose visualization, and many times these are outpatients, and the last thing we're going to do is 
be frantically clipping one of your outpatients, um, especially when you have the opportunity to uh, preempt this. Um, I'm pretty sure if we were all together in Jerry Way uh, conference room, Jerry would yell at me for clipping, but that's what I did. Um, and so I, I put two clips. There's one here. I don't have a picture of the second clip. It's a big stock. So I put two clips across the base here. Here's my post polypectomy photo. Uh, where you can see clips kind of crossing the base. What's great is after you clip this, you can actually see the head of the polyp start to engorge, turn really purple and edematous, um, you know, as if you're, you're, you're inducing uh, some loss of blood flow there. Um, I have, the yeah. The you also use glucagon in a case like this so that it, the specimen doesn't disappear downstream? I absolutely did that. Um, I, uh, because that is definitely one of the most annoying things is to lose a polyp and have it go flying out um, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, let me show you what that polypectomy looked like. Um, toggle back that video. Here we go. So it's a little bit of a, you know, it's tricky to get the snare around this. I mean, it's, it, we're down in D2. It's quite mobile. Um, eventually, you kind of wrangle your snare around it. And then you almost have to sort of work the snare back. Um, what you eventually end up doing is you kind of move the snare back and forth a little bit to sort of shimmy it up the, uh, the, um, the long stalk of the polyp. And you're sort of seeing So maybe you're going to trust me that it acts. So there we go. You can sort of see here, I eventually get around it. And then in order to move up that polyp, um, I'm going to move it kind of back and forth. And you eventually end up sliding up the entire shaft of that polyp here. You can see my clips over there. And eventually, I get it to the point where I'm really around this base. And then I close the snare. And then right after the close, uh, here we go. So we had just given a half milligram of glucagon right prior to um, coming through with cautery. It was a pretty big stock. It took a while to pop off. And then, of course, the next thing that happens is a couple of choice curse words from me as I go shooting down the duodenum. And I can't even reach it with the upper scope. And so uh, I actually have to kind of go back and get a colonoscope to go and get the darn thing. Um, but eventually grab it and uh, send it off to pathology. And there was the uh, ever so exciting um, pathfinding of, as Nikhil called it, pedunculated Brunner gland lesion, dilated Brunner glands, smooth muscle bundle, adipose tissue, large vessel suggestive of Brunner gland hamartoma, um, which, uh, which I mean we do see every so often, every every year or two, we get one of these large, large Brunner gland lesions. They can sometimes um, cause bleeding, they can ulcerate, they can twist. Um, beyond that, they don't usually cause any other symptoms. Um, and, uh, and that was it. The patient did really well. No post polypectomy bleeding, no bleeding during the case. You saw that that stalk was really nice and dry and it looked really good. Um, any uh, questions? Yeah, I, I think in the duodenum, you know, it's, it's pretty rare to get sporadic adenomas in the duodenum to begin with. And in the bulb, that's exactly where Brunner's glands reside. Uh, once you get past the bulb, you don't see many Brunner's glands. Um, I mean, you do, but um, I, I think the bulb is really where you see the most. So yeah, um, I was kind of guessing that it, there's even uh, Brunner gland adenomas, oh. um, just hamartomas. Um. Yeah, the, uh, the glucagon's helpful. I'm a big fan of clipping. I, I do this in the colon too. Anytime there's a big stock more than like three, four or five millimeters, that 20% bleed rate, I, we clinically do see. Um, and if you, if you take a pedunculated polyp and take it too close and, and resect too close to the colonic wall, that vessel kind of drops into the wall and it becomes very hard to clip it after the fact. So I always make sure to leave a little bit of stock out so you have something to treat if you need to. Um, but I've seen some pretty awful bleeds from, from these kinds of lesions. I don't like endo loops. I find them hard to use. It's very easy to tear through a polyp. I think you need someone who's really comfortable with endo loops. Um, so I just 
we're good at clipping. Uh, we all know how to clip. And so I just clip and there's data to support that now. Satish, did you think this was the cause of bleeding, first of all? And second of all, did you use pure coagulation current or did you use a combination of coagulation and cutting? You know, I, in terms of the first question of whether I thought this was the cause of bleeding, I think he still needs a small bowel evaluation. I think this is pretty likely to be the cause of bleeding, um, but he's older, he's got some cardiovascular risk factors, he could have small bowel AVMs. If the capsule is normal, I'd feel pretty comfortable that this was his cause of bleeding. I know these lesions can, can uh, ulcerate and, and, and have a little torsion. Um, you know, my general preference is to, I generally use coag current for most everything. What happened with this is this lesion is so thick, it started to desiccate out. And once it dries out, the, the snare, the coag current requires moisture to sort of like boil and burst to allow you to get through the tissue. Um, so midway through, I actually just switched to cut current because um, the snare was about to get stuck. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I needed to go that direction. Would you have, um, Jerry, gone right to cut current? Like, um, or would you have done the similar thing with coag? I would have pulled harder. <laughs> <laughs> but you wouldn't have clipped. Oh, I would have. I would have probably put a put a loop on it, uh, or a clip. But I think I'm surprised that the clip did good because with these very thick stalks, the clip barely or rarely goes over the entire um, circumference of the polyp. So um, I would probably opt for a. Uh, a loop rather than clips. Yeah, I ended up doing two clips. Um, you're right though, it, it can be tricky to get all the way around. Um, any other comments? All right, um, 